show with published authors, writers, and content creators discussing both the creative and technical sides of writing, as well as the industry surrounding it from novels to screenplays to comics and more. And now, here's your host, author Travis I. Sivart. Thank you, Cogsley. I forgot to pull a book down. Hold on, I got one. Because I'm very excited about this. I'm your host, I'm Travis Sivart, and uh, my latest book is going to be the second one in this series, and this is Journal of a Stranger, and it's right now with Tara, and I think she might have even started editing it today. So, that's what I'm excited about. Let me pass around, let everybody do their intros. What we're going to do is just pass it clockwise as you guys, our viewers, see it on the screen, starting with directly above me, John. I'm John from Conquest Publishing in Jersey's Parts and Comics. I'm going to share with you a nice, new, wonderful piece of artwork from our Queen's Compass. Nice. Title. What's that nice. series about? It is, um, think early flight steampunk uh but it's in the desert uh but they're a race that kind of bounces between um earth and into their world so gotcha this, the queen's compass so it's a magic item that allows somebody to travel between the two so and then in the center of our screen the woman we all revolve around with her amazing skills and talents tara Hi, I'm Tara Muller, and I am Dreamer-in-Chief at Dreampunk Press, and I'm just going to throw up a couple of our novellas that are now available in print form. They're also available as an ebook. but since it is June, I've chosen these two. One is Riley for Real, um, trans character, um, and then also Gamers, and if you can't figure out from the title what this cute little romance might have involved for the month of June... I can't help you, but. Very good. Um, Tara, your background is blurred. Do you remember how to unblur that? Um, yes. Go ahead and do that while we uh, go to the upper right and have Aaron introduce himself. Uh, hi, I'm Aaron Kennedy. Uh, I am the author of Persona Non Grata, the first of the Ships of Valor series. Uh, I am currently working on Icarus Black. Uh, a young adult uh, series, uh, which is basically Harry Potter in space, um, uh, forthcoming. <laughs> nice. How's your word count on that going? Uh, I'm about halfway through the first book. Really? Uh, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's about, uh, haven't quite finished Act 2. Oh. Uh, so uh, looking nice. Okay, very good. And then last but not least, because we like to save the best for last, Tempe. Hi, I'm Tempe Wade. I'm the author of the Timely Revolution book series, which is historical time travel fantasy fiction based during the Revolutionary War. Uh, books one through five are out. Number five in the series was just released, The Steep Cost of Fate, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I'm also working on some fantasy stuff that I'll hopefully be seeing soon. Very nice, very nice. Now, our topic tonight... Oh, by the way, I want to ask our viewers, what are you guys reading or writing? Let us know what you're reading or writing in the chat right now. We may not respond to it on air, but we will at least create that community feel as shows we're all working on things. Um, the other thing I want to let everybody know is if you are watching this live and you miss an episode or an episode of Talk of the Tavern or Stealing for Survival, don't forget you can find those on really almost any of the big streaming services, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and we have been accepted for all three shows to Pandora. They're just in the final review. So make sure you follow us there. Yay. And if you're listening to us on a podcast, feel free to join us live for Right Night every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, barring unforeseen circumstances. There is generally three to six of us here talking about a creative topic and a technical topic. And tonight, our creative topic for the first hour is Critter Creation, um, which was requested by Tempe and Michael last week. And then the, for the second hour, we're going to talk about price points, because most of us are self-published, 
if not all of us. So because of that, we get to choose our own price point, and we're going to look a little more into that in the second hour. <clears throat> you okay there, Aaron? By the way, Aaron, we only got you from chin up. So if oh. you want to angle your camera or, <laughs> or sit up, get a high chair. Um, so, right, critter creation. That's what we're going to start with. Does anybody have any opening thoughts on this? Ooh. I can start. Um, <laughs> I've always uh, no, I, <laughs> Go I'm, ahead, I'm actually working on a couple of them now. Um, so, freaking... Uh, in Persona Non Grata, I had to create uh, an AI. Uh, the ship. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I created the ship. Hart is an AI. He is... Um, he's a critter. He's not human. He's an anthropomorphized ship. So he's he is a... A being that is pretending to be human um, so that's one of the things but I make reference to alien races that exist there go it, ahead Travis it's to totally talk about that right now <clears throat> when I thought of critter creation I never thought about AIs or robots or machines but they very much fall into that thing so that that's a great point we can hit on again and again during this hour go on about the critters now the alien races Okay. Uh, well, and one of the things that I popped into was I wanted to make sure that uh, it, Hart, I describe him as the best of us because um, he's trying to be human. He's trying to be what we want to be, what we aspire to be. Um, as I got into the second book, uh, Politicus, um, I actually introduced... Uh, what's called uh, the uh, Lirwin, um, which is space otters. Um, and I reintroduced them in... Uh, yeah, I know, I know, everybody loves space otters. Um, I reintroduced them into the Icarus uh, Black novels. Um, there's a, a space otter called Oka, uh, which is Spanish for goose. Um, she's the ship's engineer uh, on Valor, or Val. Um mm -hmm. Who is one of the lead characters um, and do I want to anthropomorphize an otter or it's they're not otters they just happen to look like them um, and it's one of those Aerie makes a comment of he couldn't help but imagine them as otters right uh, and this kind of comes back to um, the fool novels um, for those that are familiar with them um, a fool's errand, uh, a fool and his money, and things like that. Robert Asprin. They in exact, uh, exactly. Um, he introduces a character that looks like a, bun a bunny rabbit. Um, and it's one of those... He kind of twitches... Uh, he, it's a legionnaire, and he looks like a rabbit. And he smirks, and it's like, no, 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 he's not a rabbit. He just kind of looks like one. The space otters, they just kind of look like rabbits. They're not rabbits. They're not otters. But as humans, we're going to right. have this impression. And we're going to do that kind of thing. Um, so that's where I went with this. Um, I make reference to a couple, uh, another race. Um, and I call them cat monkeys. Um, the the cobra. Mm-hmm. Um, and I make that in uh, Ships of Valor, uh, or I make that in uh, Persona Non Grata. Um, they're running around the spaceports. They're little, they're baggage jockeys. Um, they're honest to a fault. They're somewhat telepathic. Um, they're communal. And go ahead. When you're creating a critter. Do you start mm -hmm. with a concept of personality and or abilities beyond human and then lay a skin over them? Or do you start with a skin in your mind? In other words, when I say skin, it's kind of a gamer term. Um, it also branches over into role-playing games. Do you picture a physical form and then put the goodies into the physical form? What do you start with? Uh, uh, so the cavern, um, Persona Non Grata started with a single scene. Um, it was a guy waiting to go home. Um, that scene was cut. Um, it was the first two chapters of the book were were cut. 
Um, he actually ended. Uh, I pulled him from the space. I had him in a space. This does lead into oh. creating a critter, right? Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. <laughs> so he was in a spaceport waiting to go home. Uh, so one of the scenes that happened in the spaceport was the caverns. Um, well, these caverns, I had them running around doing these things, and it was okay. Well, you got like a scene from airport well what would they look like what were these guys doing um and you got these critters what what kind of baggage jockey what would a alien baggage jockey kind of look like mm -hmm. well what, and it was that skin now is um, that the otters or is this something else? no these were these were the caverns the cat monkey things <laughs> oh thank you i see i, I um, heard the word caverns like caves uh, yeah, yeah a, a cavern uh, but it doesn't matter. It's uh, so they were these little cat monkey kind of guys. Um, figure they're about yay big, big enough to kind of move a suitcase, but not much bigger than that. So, kind of um, classic 1930s cartoon. The 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 bellhop. You always kind of pictured it like the little skinny spider monkey because of the guys with the music box. That's exactly it. No, that makes sense. It's an association in the reader's mind that they can unconsciously make and automatically breathe life into it. Now, John, at some point in time, I want to turn to you because you, being a visual artist, which is what we now call artists, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm sure you might have a different process because if it's on the page. But before I do, and Aaron... Cut me off here if I'm cutting you off before you're done. No, no, you're fine. That 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 was kind of the how my onus of there, um, of doing that, and okay. then uh, I'm going to point at Tempe. Tempe, I know you're working on a medieval fantasy type situation, and I'm going to come back right. to you, Tara. Do you have a point of reference in something you've written where you have made creatures or critters or monsters? Yep. Tell us a little about Revelation of Fog. Um, and I came up with the essence of the, the, the being first. Um, and it's actually the, uh, essence, the desolation of physical fog or is mental essence. The mental Okay. The, the 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 I guess the feeling of the creature first. And in developing it, um, they are actually um, souls who have decided not to move on to the afterlife the way they're supposed to. Um, Desolation of Fog kind of starts off with somebody being killed and they end up in what um, could be purgatory, could be something else. Um, but it is a different... Uh, there are people there from different times, but then there are, they have companion animals. But those companion animals are not really, those are souls who have kind of degraded back or switched into an animal and then eventually become this thing. And we, oh, we lost Tara for a second. Okay, Tara's back. If, sorry. Repeat the um, last 10 seconds. <laughs> These creatures that became. Um, so they, people's souls kind of devolve into a companion animal of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, there is a dog that is in here that um, towards the end, um, the main character realizes what's kind of happening. Um, and you don't really see what they eventually devolve into if they don't get into heaven properly. Um, but you hear them <laughs> and you see what they do. The, the aftermath of their destruction from the main character's point of view because they happen to meet up with another By young way, person who's there who died. But If you could take everything you just said and boil it down to a tweet length, that is a great um, uh, elevator pitch. Because right there, I want to read your book just because... You know, these creatures that were people have devolved into uh, the spirit form of animals and can dissolve, devolve, devolve further. You never see them, but you hear them. Mm -hmm. That right there is a great elevator pitch. And I don't even know that's the main storyline or just a sideline, but I want to read it. That's kind of a sideline of the critter thing. Um, but to, to, to talk about critter creation, um, 
I started with the feeling that these creatures evoked in people. Um, they're the the people that are there, the, the main character and her companion talk about what they might look like, um, but they never actually really really see enough to to see what they look like. But um, like I said, the main character in the end kind of under, starts to understand what's going on. So I'm curious with this. Are these critters in your book, not necessarily as the author, but for the characters, are these critters' forms more shaped by the viewer than the being itself? Yes. That's very cool. That's very in cool. In some way. Yeah. No, no. That's, um, yeah, and I don't want to necessarily give spoilers or anything, but that, that's yeah. a very interesting point. So... Shall we take a moment and jump over to John? I want the Tempe. I want you to go last because you are currently developing things. So I kind of want to let everybody get some stuff out, and then go to you in okay. case you're looking to have a little bit of a brainstorm session or looking for how other people do it, so you can pick and choose and discard what you don't like and keep what you do. Um, okay. Tarek, do you have more to add before I jump to John for the opening? No. Nope. Okay, John, and again. I know you've wrote, you, you have written stories, but also as a, a artist, as a visual artist, you have to definitely envision, and I'm wondering, does that push you more towards creating the form before the content, or do you still, like a lot of writers, create the content and wrap a form around it? We, believe it or not, create the content first and then that, and, that, and it's actually a, somewhat of a project-driven uh, work. We're pretty fortunate we have a psychiatrist that's on our staff. Because <laughs> artists it's are fucked up. Because, uh, we're working with a lot of kids and they drive us crazy, but no. Um, but it it's a person that I can go to and say, all right, I have this critter and this is what I want the critter to do. What triggers and stuff would they have and what would they do? What kind of visual clues would I use on that particular uh, critter or character that's in the thing. Um, a superhero book, the critters have to have a threat level um, higher than the hero of the book or the, the people in the book, or you can't be heroic unless you overcome certain things. So you, you kind of scale um, what the critter that you're designing based off of what the book is about. Um, comics are a little bit different. Now, in novels like Tether and stuff, the aliens, we actually had to come up with, why are they so conniving? Why do they steal things? Why do they think that they have to trick people into doing this? It's normal for them, but it's an, it's an important part of the whole story. So with, with Paul, he's able to tell me, this is probably the things that you want to incorporate into the story, you know, that a person that usually is a kleptomaniac or somebody that's like this would do these things. That's cool. Now, I, I have a two-part question before we pass it to Tempe. First of all, what's the weirdest creature you've come up with personally? And then the second part is, what's your favorite one that you've come up with? Because it could be two very different answers. Um, and paint a picture for us. Creature-wise, Probably the most um, unique one we have is a sentient black hole or a warp um, that was created um, by a dying race. And all the souls and stuff kind of mingled together and it just traveled through space and it just causes terror throughout, you know, different it's galaxies. devouring souls? It, it, not only did it start from the souls that it devoured, but as it picks up more, it brings more terror. It just gets stronger. It is like goes. a traveling science hell. It is. That's pretty damn cool. <laughs> Probably the most visually impactful one. I mean, we, we, we love fantasy, so uh, there's a lot of dragons and stuff in our fantasy. Um, and it depends, really, since we're doing role-playing games and stuff, too, we have to come up with visual things and stuff right. like that. But we actually have a swamp that's sentient, and 
it's huge. It's, you know, think of the Amazon almost. I mean, it's not quite to that scale, but it is sentient, and it doesn't want people there. So. That reminds me of a Piers Anthony book, which, by the way, Aaron, a quick sideline to you. You might read uh, Bio of a Space Tyrant, five-book series by Piers Anthony from the 80s. It might help you with, like, Politico. Tempe, what have you made so far that you're very happy with or just absolutely like, what the hell, I don't want this, but I need something? I'm very much basing the Critters characters on the old world stuff, the old legends. Um, That's just kind of my forte. That's the thing that I do. Um, So with this medieval piece it's it's kind of a different take on um a later version of king arthur Mm -hmm. and merlin and kind of what happened afterwards on in my version in a different world right uh so i have you know i have dragons i have house elves i have brownies uh that type of thing and one of the characters that i have is a dragon that's actually like a, a person she talks she's the best friend of one of the main characters um, you know, he, growing up, she was his confidant. She, he was like the one she he would go to when he had a problem, and she would advise him and that type of thing. So I'm very much I'm not much about building new creatures, but more about basing it on the old world ones and maybe giving them a life of their own. I have a house brownie that's name is his name is Fig. And he's very, you know, he's contentious and cantankerous, and he likes to argue with the main character, but they're very much, you know, best friends. So um, that that's kind of, and, and he, even with the Timely series, you know, the Fae are very much a big part of that, which is an old legend. So, um, you know, I built the characters off of that. Like, Finn is very much a character all his own. <laughs> he's, right. uh... You know he's he's got he's got a, a big personality and he's very much his own. So. It's uh, I think there is a lot of value in recreating something we already know because there's a there's a baseline that we're all familiar with, but then you can write it in a different way or a very familiar way, and either way your reader has something to associate with. Now for me, if I may, I have been creating creatures since i was very young playing with star wars action figures you make up the monsters they're fighting playing dungeons and dragons in my early teens and since he's playing with his dolls again uh that's right action figures damn it um you you something you learn to do to mess with john and aaron who's been playing as long or longer than me is you can take a classic monster whereas tempe right here is talking about taking classic monster and creating a new personality or a new take on it in Dungeons and Dragons when you're creating a monster you could take something straight out of the book and give it a different skin and now it's a brand new monster for your players now your qualified player your players that have been around long enough they'll start to recognize one or two things and go this is just like that let me try that and this gives and this does relate to writing in this sense An experienced player will recognize certain traits even though it looks different and then possibly experiment with something that would have worked on this other thing. And this works for characters in writing also as they face these creatures. Uh, We all know what a tree ent is or an ent from Lord of the Rings, you know, a a, a intelligent plant life tree. Uh, And you generally know they're not harmful, but they'll protect the woods, etc. You can take a creature like this and give it a brand new skin and make it look like a mud monster or anything else. And once your characters see it speaking and moving slowly, seeing it being thoughtful and saying it takes years for us to, they maybe relate to that directly or indirectly. But in my books, I've done the same thing. And I've had classic monsters, or critters, or creatures, or beings. But one thing I really enjoy is, in the current book I'm writing, Portals, book two, demons. There's a demon invasion. And with demons, to me, they're like bad, mad scientist experiments. Things that shouldn't work together, that have been crammed together. And they're these broken creations that are 
pushed into our world. And, and that's very fun. The hardest part for me of that, uh, for example, do we all remember the petite lap giraffe from yeah. th these commercials where it was like this little teeny giraffe on a, on a treadmill? It's like an insurance, a so Koblowski Farms or something. Well, yeah, the Russian guy. Yeah. I took those and blended them with, uh, was it a cat or a monkey? Um, but it's a blend of those two things, and it gives a visual for the viewer, for the reader. But it's now horrible and attacking and killing people, and it has acid for blood. So it allows me to create these monstrosities that are just absolutely unthought of, for the most part, by others, but tie them into familiar pieces. Um, I think the... Th Go ahead, Tempe. No, I, I was just going to say that's what one of the things I was aiming for with this fantasy piece that I'm working on, is that I wanted it, if it's somebody new to fantasy, I wanted that something familiar, mm -hmm. you know, something that wasn't completely off the wall, because I'm new to writing this fantasy piece, so it's kind of... It, it, I wanted something that would appeal to the people who are new to it mm -hmm. and the people who are used to it. See? So, you know, kind of find that fine line in and between. And that's so. definitely good. One second, Tar, I'll pass it right over to you. Um, with these beings, they are three people from this world brought into that world. And because of that, for fantasy readers that are familiar with the genre, I wanted something new for them but relatable enough for somebody that's never read fantasy and that it's obviously a messed up weird creature. But then when you run across demon dogs, which are just kind of the shadowy dog beings that chase you, like the wild hunt sort of thing, there's still kind of both ends of that. Um, and either is relatable and valid. Tara? Yeah, I was just going to, since we kind of drifted into taking something that exists and either adapting it or describing it in a new way or giving it a name. Um, a, no, a, a novelette, novella, mm -hmm. ebook that I was involved in, in with developmental editing called The When, just released. And that's what that author did, and the author's N.R. Fry. Um, but what's interesting is he takes it so that The When is how a child perceived this monster. Ah. Gave it the name the when, um, and so as you're you're reading through this this novella as he's reaching the truth of what happened and what it is, um, which turns into being uh, and I'm not going to give it away so I'm not going to say what it is, but it isn't it turns into the understanding, and as somebody if if you know what it is when he gets there it's a bit of an obscure monster which I think would be great. We, we kind of tend to go with the ogres um, and the fairies and the brownies that are very European. Um, and there are monsters from other cultures that you can play with if you do it respectfully. The Rukshaza um, is a great one. So the idea of taking it and the description being as a child does it, but then as you keep going, as an adult reading it, you start to realize what it is. It's kind of great because then you recognize those childhood descriptions of what's going on and what it is. That's awesome. Um, so that's a way to take that is to take, again, to take a known monster, but give it the spin of what a child might a think about perception. it. And then you... Yes. Now, I want to go to John and then Aaron, and then I'd love to talk about which is a better way to do a monster. The... Alien, original movie, where it's just a lot of suggestion and hints. They did this a lot in the 50s and 60s monster movies. Or outright just showing this is the horrible creature. John, you raised your hand first and pass it to Aaron when you're done, please. Uh, well, I was just going to say we, we're pretty fortunate that we've met um, a father and daughter from one of the most uh, remote cultures on the planet from Easter Island. Hmm. And they're sharing some of their tales and myths and stuff like that that most people have never even heard of. That's awesome. And in a lot of things we can gather, and I tell the, the, the kids here, it is that, you know, even though it was in mythology and, and other sources, doesn't mean you can't use them as inspiration to do mm -hmm. things. So. Or outright use go them ahead. and go, hey, look, this is real in this world. 
It's uh, and by the way, before you pass it to Aaron, can you give us a quick example of one? Because I'm damn curious. Well, they're they're writing them mostly, but a lot of their critters are spirits. A lot um, of the Asian stuff is. Right. Now, Marvel wrote crappy stories about like the giant statues got out of the ground and started going around and attacking people and stuff. It's like, they, they think that it's funny like the Discovery Channel will come out there and try to explain how they move the things around and stuff. And that the inside joke is they should just ask us how we move them around instead of coming <laughs> up with their own explanations on how, they, how it was, this happened. So have you heard how they really moved them? They moved them on boats. Oh. So... They, they found out that, you know, that their, their concave roads and stuff because they drew the boats down with them on there. Interesting. Very cool. Aaron. But they're trying to wiggle them down the road and stuff with ropes. And... We've all moved to couch upstairs. <laughs> Giant weebles. Uh, one of the things, uh, I'm a big fan of adaptations. Uh, huge, huge fan of adaptations and monsters and critters are nothing more than that uh scary things in the dark and all that uh, i was actually having a conversation with one of my customers today in regards to that um and i made the comment of um a bug's life mm -hmm. uh and uh the lion king both are adaptations um the lion king is hamlet a bug's life is seven samurai Right. Uh, or the Magnificent Seven, depending on which one you're looking at. What culture um, you've been exposed to. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, but you start getting into, like, critters and things like that. Like, the word bear. Um, bears are so scary that we have forgotten what the original word for bear is. <laughs> uh, bear goes back to the word brown. Uh, but bears were so scary that we don't use the word that bear comes from and we just said okay brown it was just this brown scary thing in the dark um or freaking uh to travis's point uh alien it's it's the classic trope of scary things in the dark mm -hmm. uh or the chronicles of riddick um scary things in the dark um <laughs> yeah uh, scary things in the dark is an awesome trope um uh, and it, it works. It works really, really well. Or when you go to Alien and then Aliens, more scary things in the dark. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, John, what you got, sir? Just as a quick side note, I, I thought it was unique that Dark Horse Comics actually uh, went to their planet, and they're not the most scariest things. They're like us to lions. There were so many worse things on their planet. It could kill things. Those were the weakest of them. <laughs> Physically. Right. Those were the rats and the pigeons. Yeah. So. <clears throat> so should we go ahead and branch into seen versus unseen monsters and the differences it creates in your viewer, reader, etc.? Oh, absolutely. I see Tara well, raise her eyebrows. You got some stuff on this, Tara, and then we'll pass it to Aaron. Yeah, because there's there's two ways you look at that that when when you think about because we've been talking about in the dark, the monsters in the dark, and in um, Dumpire Legacy, which is the third in the trilogy, um, by E.G. Gaddis, the vampire um, Dumpire tr trilogy. Um, there's a there's a twist on the monster, and you're expecting the monster to still be the vampire. Mm-hmm. Which is the scary thing that um, the three siblings are discovering and finding out about. And they find that, um, in a way, the vampire, because they know what the vampire is going to do. And you, when, when you look at a vampire, um, a lot of times you can tell they're a vampire. And so you learn to recognize it. And then, but when it's something recognizable that you have been, you know, raised to not be afraid of. And that is your monster it, you know because again that's another type of unseen monster the monster inside uh, cujo let's think about cujo it's somebody's pet dog but when that dog because huge becomes rabid they become a monster but again when you think of somebody's pet dog <laughs> you, you're trying not to think that they're they're monsters so just another 
thing to think about that, and I'm going to go and mute while my phone talks at me. <laughs> okay. Aaron. All right. Um, so, uh, an old uh, Heinlein book, uh, and there's, there's two points here. One was there was an old Heinlein book, and it said, uh, Beware of Stover. Uh, it was Tunnel, uh, Tunnel in the Sky. Um, and if you wanted to uh, get, like, a survival rating, um, they would drop you off on a planet, and you had to survive for, like, three months. Um, and the idea was, beware of Stober. Um, they didn't tell you what Stober was, but it was just a, it was an ad hoc warning of, hey, uh, keep an eye out for these things. Oh, um, and uh, keep an eye out for these things. And it was kind of like the old, here be dragons out on the old maps. Mm -hmm. Um scary things in the dark water um, monsters terrifying uh, it, it, well yeah because uh well the only thing scarier than water on a ship is fire um and i'm sure john's familiar with that uh as well as tara <laughs> tara's navy also mid -rats are horrible. say again mid rats are pretty horrible too yeah, yeah, yeah yes they are <laughs> i've had many of those <laughs> i don't even know what this is do i eat it or i starve <laughs> But um, I'm starving's better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Tara, uh, Tara is very familiar with these as well. Indeed. <laughs> um, but um, you go out into these the unknown, and what's out there? What are what are we fearing? Um, and it's it's just the stuff, um, and. It, it's another trope. It's uh, uh, you find yourself on this deserted planet and you're wondering, okay, here it is, or the uh, Australia. Okay, <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> uh, yeah, Australia's got it all. Yeah. Oh, and friggin' uh, what was it? Friggin' uh, Terry Pratchett did the forex. Um, uh, his novel of 4X, and he's like, okay, hey, uh, well, everything's poisonous ex except for some species of sheep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's a great novel. Uh, but I, I love that concept of these are the big bads. Uh, and not even the biggest of the bads, it's just some of it. Tempe, seen versus unseen? Um, I... You know, I'm very much of... I, I, I like to write creatures kind of a little a little vague because I'm always curious to see how other people interpret it. I like because that. It's always, it's always very... It, it, it's very... When I'm at a convention and I'm at a table and somebody comes up and they'll describe one of my characters and I'll go, really? Because that's not how I see that person in my head at all. <laughs> now, do you get upset when they do that? No, no, I'm just, I'm just curious to see how they, and, and Finn is, the King of the Fae is one of the characters. Um, I posted a picture one day of somebody that I thought resembled him, and somebody posted, was like, I don't think he looks anything like that. I imagined him to look like this person, and then somebody else was like, oh, I imagined him to look like this person, and it's, it's fun to me to see how other people interpret it, and that's, that's the fun of reading a book. Uh, is you, you get your own, you have your own picture in your mind, you know, that's not preset like in a movie or a TV show. You, you've you got that, your own imagination to use there, so. Now, John, did you already comment on this, or do you have some thoughts before I go into mine? Oh, no, well, I haven't commented. Go ahead. Well, I, I will be honest. I mean, this is probably the weakest area that I have for... If it relates to horror, because I, I just actually I refuse to edit it for other people's stories. I'll push it on to somebody else. Now, and the unseen tends to lead into those particular uh, things. But for critters on other things, visually, I mean, yes, I love those those types of things because a critter to me is an alien. It could be a fae. It could be a dragon. It could be a, a big brooding monster. Or that giant, horrible space, you know, vacuum that's eating souls and stuff and moving throughout the galaxy. But when it comes to horror, I just am not very uh, good at it. So I, I pass it on to other people. A few of my thoughts is um, 
First of all, Bird Box, I think that's the name of the movie on Netflix, with the unseen thing that tracks sound and you can't look at them. Because if you look at them, you go mad. The Bird Box. Bird Box. Yeah, yeah. Bird Box. Um, that is a great concept because there's something you never, the characters never want to see. So nobody can describe it. So here's something where the writers didn't even have to much worry about it. It's all about the suspense and tension. And half of the scariness, if not more, is all in the viewers and the characters' heads. Um, another great concept that branches out into another version of this, Jekyll and Hyde. It's the monster inside of each character, which I think Tara was referencing this a little bit earlier without trying to give spoilers about her book, but I could be wrong. I've read those, but I don't recall what she's talking about. Um, it's been too long. So we want to talk about, um, hey, Juicy, good to see you. And also glad to see Let's screen, uh, let's Write Screenplay. Glad to see you guys. Thank you for jumping in. Um, so anybody want to talk about the monster inside a little bit? I will. I'll, I will. Go ahead, Tara. Then pass it to John when that, you're done. That exactly. And then I'll pass it to John. But, um, yeah, the fact that um, that benign best friend can turn into a monster. Um, sometimes you can you see it happening. Sometimes you don't. Or that person that seems so nice and perfect and genteel and whatnot is actually in their free time at home, you know, uh, a monster. They're, they're right. doing horrible things. Um, another book that I was involved in the development and editing of, um, Pamela K. Kinney's Maverick Heart, which is um, science fiction. Horror. Um, almost horror. I... I'm, I'm, I'm having to redefine my... I, I never realized I wrote horror until somebody said that that, that read like horror, and I'm like, okay. Um, but where you have something that's scary, that you think is scary and trying to hurt you, but what it's done is it's perceived you as a threat, as the horror, as the monster, and once the, the realization is that then what you thought was scary and was big and horrible and monstrous isn't what you really have to be afraid of. So I think that's, you know, when you're designing a critter, um, sometimes you take, and, and because we're not always just de de um, developing horror critters, sometimes if you're it's sci-fi and fantasy, you're developing something that is actually benign. And I think sometimes, you know, it's the soft bunny that looks like a soft bunny, but sometimes it's the thing with fangs that's a soft bunny. Ender's Game is a great example of this. Um, and for those of you who haven't read it, well, spoilers anyway, um, you have this alien species, the whole book they're fighting against, and at the very end, the main character finds out the humans are the monsters who are hunting and killing these things. Um, another great thing to point out is it doesn't have to be horror. You could take a romantic drama, and there's a character in there who looks so nice and perfect and benign and in the end they're the ones just twisting things and, and breaking things for whatever their motivation is Tara were you done should we pass it to uh, John what's that do it I said Tempe's book five has one of those nice, <laughs> yeah. nice. So, yes oh just wait <laughs> you want to hold that up real quick there Tempe uh, yeah there you go for folks that are interested this yeah. is go ahead it's deep cost of fate but you've got to read the first four to go with it before this one will make sense. <laughs> there we go. John, some thoughts? Um, so, with the Monster Within, we have a political thriller that we're working on. <laughs> uh, what's unique about it, though, is that as as the monster, you learn more and more about the monster. As you, hopefully you figure out what's actually going on. You start sympathizing with the monster. Right. But it also... It, so... It's well, the cat's out of the bag somewhat. Um, a man, uh, an ex-military uh, person, was tortured and left, you know, you know, abandoned. When he comes back, 
uh, it splits his personality. He becomes a CIA operative, but at night the other personality comes out, and he actually hypnotizes himself to believe certain things, the bad guy part of it, or the monster part. And the first part of it is there's a, a senator who's telling people that torture is bad, and it's never going to happen, he won't allow it. And as he gets dropped off from his hammers, he goes into his house, and all of a sudden, all the lights go off and the door locks. And he sees this great big huge screen that's on, and he sees his son on the, on the screen. And then off to the side, as we pan over, you see a guy standing there with a cloth over the couch and the chair. He goes, well, Senator, I really don't believe what you're telling everybody, but we're going to put this to the test. And he pulls the uh, cloth off and all these scalpels and stuff were there. And he goes, I'm going to be your first victim and we're going to record this. And we're going to show people, you know, how much your conviction is, what you're not going to do, what you are going to do. But he lets the guy actually, and he tells him how to torture him because it's what he went through before. Interesting. And then obviously it's broadcast and now all of a sudden the senator's out. But he, as the agent, gets assigned to find himself throughout the whole book. It's always a great plot. Um, another interesting plot of the monster inside. Has everybody seen the movie or read the book A Beautiful Mind? Russell Crowe starred in it. It's basically based on true events of a World War II cipher, somebody who was deciphering codes and whatnot, and he slowly starts to mentally break down. So he starts to uh, dive into paranoia about conspiracies and bringing this into his work. And the people around him, you know, are, are telling him, hey, you're, you're breaking. John? And actually mine goes in the opposite direction. So as he does these things, he heals. So. Interesting. Catharsis. It, torture. Yeah. So, <laughs> well... That's not the only thing he does. <laughs> That's the first thing. It's because it's a visual. It's a comic book. Well, I tell you what. One of the scariest monsters in my mind is my mind failing. It's uh, more so than Jaws. I mean, I look at Beautiful Mind almost like a horror movie because... Yeah, John. No, well, I mean, in one of the other uh, Twitch streams, we were talking about that. Um, my, my grandfather passed on from... Uh, from Lou Gehrig's disease and that's the whole thing you're trapped in your own body mm -hmm. you actually forget how to breathe and he asked me to end uh, his life and I couldn't so you know that you know, but those are things that I mean you latch on to those things and you try to bring that emotion back into stories but you know but yeah there's definitely uh, things like that that you know can be who, as you said. Who hasn't had a chance to talk about this tangent? That Aaron? Um, there's a couple great books out there, uh, not a TV series, uh, but um, Spider Robinson had one, um, and it was the Death Killer series, uh, where he talks about, basically they force amnesia on a guy, um, uh, which was an interesting take on the... Uh, the monster within kind of set up um, but the one that I actually liked was the Christian Slater TV series The Enemy Within um, kind of a loving father, husband whatnot. Um, but they kind of flip a switch and he becomes a spy um, great little series, 2005-ish uh, kind of time frame mm -hmm. um, worth the watch done well um, and he goes from kind of a nice guy to Christian Slater. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, and it's done well, and it, it's got that very personality um, typecast mode. Uh, but what kind of keyed me into this conversation was the original, wor the working title of uh, Persona Non Grata was uh, Lest We Become Monsters. Um, uh, and um, the way I had kind of written it up uh, was uh, Airy, uh, the, the narrator, um, is the narrator. He's not the pro he's not the main character of the story. Hart is the main character of the story. Right. Um, and um, 
Ares telling Hart's journey and more specifically of this child or young adult and how he's not becoming this monster. Um, and they're, the idea is that he's progressing and he's making these choices to where he's not taking some of these same paths that Ari potentially would have. Right. Um, there's a couple key scenes where Ari probably would have went a much darker path <laughs> um, over the course of the book. Um, so your, your ship turns out to be the conscience. Uh, absolutely. The, the Jiminy Cricket, if you will. Now, Tempe, did you have a chance to comment on this, or do you have anything to add before I throw one last thing at us to wrap this up? Uh, no, I think I, I was <laughs> thought we were doing the topic on the, um, like the creatures and stuff, and we kind of jumped off. So. <laughs> but no, that's fine. Go ahead. Well, well, you can go back to that if you want. This is all part of that monster thing. Sometimes the monster is ourselves. Um, the the one thing. Oh, go ahead, John. Well, and I mean, there are, and that actually, I was going to bring up kind of the same thing. It's like, is a ghost a monster, or is it just a human in another form? But we've also got skinwalkers and stuff like that, which are your your typical, you know, werewolves and things like that take over possession and that type of thing. That, you know, and sometimes they morph into those particular creatures. I guess you. Know, I'd like to talk about motivations for the monsters. Because I think this is something that makes your monster, no matter how fantastic, more real. Um, whether it's like aliens, where their motivation was food. Super simple, easy to understand. And other monsters have a much more complex motivation. Any thoughts on this? Well, actually, their, their motivation was reproduction, mostly. <laughs> they want to lay eggs. That's important motivation. They, That's true. They were xenomorphs, but... Uh, and and I, I touched on it a little bit, because that's, I mean, Paul is a, is a great asset to us because he helps us with that, you know, helping with what would the motivation of that thing be? Because um, we kind of think, where are we going with the story? And what, what do we have to oppose somebody sometimes? What's their motivation? And this is a little bit off topic with the critter part of it, but we also assign those things to organizations and stuff too. What's the organization's motivation? Because if they're not interesting in your story, yeah, they're not really critters though. They can be making critters to uh, harm people, but anyways. Um, Tempe, yeah, I think. Were you waving? Yeah, get... yeah. I, I was just. That's what I was kind of working on with this second book on this series thing. I was looking for the dark and the light creatures. You know, kind of the the old the old spin, which which ones fall to the light side, which ones fall to the dark side. Because I've got a very decisive line there that I was uh, trying to work on. And I was trying to, you know, which do dragons fall under the light? You know, I have them falling under the light. Which creatures fall under the dark? That's kind of what I was working towards trying to, you know, because some of them do fall into a certain category. You know, typically you think of, fairies is, and dragons as being good and some people think of dragons as being bad but uh, just trying to, to, to put that that line in and figure out which ones fall on which side so yeah John well even for uh, one of the books we did uh, one of the stories we did for Fair Thee Well I mean it depends on the motivation that you give to that particular critter like in ours red he wanted to clean up the pollution that people had caused in an area. And so did our Fay too. So they, they were motivated to help right some of the wrongs that people had done. Um, but, uh, and, and sometimes I guess the, the key thing is, you know, the motivation has to be what helps your story out the most, kind of, sometimes. Tara? Yeah, I think, you know, when, you, when you're talking about motivation, motivation is what makes the monster. Uh, because you have a creature, um, and they may be doing what we perceive as something bad, something awful. But when you get to the motivation is what makes it either a monster or just something misunderstood. Um, and so 
in a way that motivation if you don't if your monster doesn't have a motivation is it really a monster so i think you you need that in some way or you need to actively determine they have no motivation for what they're doing which means they're doing it for pleasure which is a type of motivation mm -hmm. which is actually more scary or in the case of um you know john's character in in the comic where he's got a split personality does that second personality truly have a motivation or is it just out of control and in pain i mean so there's there's different types of motivation, but I think that unless you have that motivation, you really don't have a monster. You just have a being that looks scary, that could be, you know, nice. Or it's the motive, which is how you get that thing that looks beautiful, but is really a monster inside. You have a zombie. <laughs> now, Tempe, in the last couple minutes before we switch to the other topic, did you want to direct us towards something on the... No, 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 it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> We, we, we can move on. Like I said, I, when, when we set this up, I just thought that was the direction we were heading, but that's okay. But that, that's the way we go, so. Well, that's definitely stuff we can discuss beforehand. If you have a certain concept yeah. that you definitely want to touch on, that's a great time to bring it up so we make sure we get it in okay. there. Um, right. But we do have a couple minutes left. We can go back to that. I say go to it. Well, I mean, so... What, it, Going to the 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 old the old care the old things the the unicorns the sirens the wraiths that type of thing D is there a side that certain ones fall down on I mean and I know it goes to the motivation but is there because the the story I'm writing is very much like a King Arthur it's a it's a classic so I'm looking I was looking for like the classic creatures that typically fall to the dark and that typically fall to the light yeah John. So, and D&D &D has what's called a monster manual, and they typically tell you what their alignment structure is for that particular critter. It's not perfect, but it'll generally tell you that goblins tend to be, you know, more towards the evil side or orcs and those type of things. Now, they are currently getting, they're moving away from that, but the monster manual will give you a good idea, typically you know, what they were perceived of in the past. And dragons, of all things, actually fit on both sides of the spectrum, depending on motivation again. Right, right. There are certain races and creature types that tend to be on, and, and that book will tell you that, you know, this is an evil, this is a, a dark side or a light side type creature. Uh, one of the things that you really got to look at is we're human. Okay, so some things are just going to be alien. Okay, their motivations transcend us. Um, so, um, like, why why does a dragon hoard wealth? It's not because they're going to spend it. Um, yeah, maybe it's part of their evolutionary process. Um, so they absorb the energy of what would be wealth. Uh, why do Fey make deals? Is it because it's, they accumulate power from it? Um, uh, why do vampires begin feed on blood? Is it part of a curse? Is it because they're sucking the life out of things? Uh, or the undead in that regards? Because they need it. They, they, they got to get... It's the thing they're missing. Um, some of it's not necessarily good or evil. It's just... It, it's alien. And that's the, the thing there. Whereas... Some things are tied to the plane just like we are, um, your kobolds or whatever, and it's like, oh, we can understand that. They're not alien. They're on the same plane as us. Uh, you had something, John? Yeah. Um, no, I, I think Tempe wants to start with the classic, though, what the perception of these things are as a starting point, and then you can add motivation and, and changes right. into it. Um, I mean, that's just a resource, but if you think about the creatures that you want to do, I mean, you can just type in D&D &D Goblin and it'll tell you, like, it'll show you a stat. Let me ask you this, Tempe, to right. clarify what you're looking for, do you want us to just brainstorm a little and suggest some evil monsters for you? Some classic evil monsters? That's kind of what I was, yeah, that's kind of what I was looking for, because, again, I'm new to the fantasy 
Okay. You know, you guys have been doing D&D for years and stuff. I am i haven't. Okay. I'm new to all of that stuff. So. Chat, if you guys have any ideas of some good, classic, historically from our planet, monsters that could work well with her series, throw that in there. Tara, Aaron, John, any of you guys got some ideas? Well, all the undead. Put that on the side of the bad guys. What's that? Uh, all the undead. The undead, okay. Zombies, skeletons, <laughs> wraiths, ghosts, vampires, mummies, all that falls. Okay. Because Pretty basically their motivation is to eat us for one reason or another. Whether it's our energy, <laughs> yep. our Hunger. blood, our bodies, our brains. Uh, and also right. going back past modern mythology of stuff. Um, Mira says brownies have been, no, have been known to be tricksters. Do they count? Uh, Mira, in a way, yes. Uh, Tempe is definitely dealing with the fae in the fairy world. So a lot of the fairies that we think of as good now, leprechauns, brownies, etc., they were out to rake us across the coals and take advantage of us one way or the right. other. Tara, do you have right. some thoughts? Um, when we think like unicorns, um, something to think about is when you think of the unicorns and their purity, only virgins could actually call them to them and stuff like that. So I think when you're, you're, if you're going and doing some of the, the research, um, most of them fall in the dark side of things, unless virgins are involved. So only, only virgins could call unicorns, so my characters are screwed, right? <laughs> well, if they were, like, they can't call my, a unicorn. Yeah. Yeah. None of my uh, characters can call unicorns. <laughs> like, it's a purity thing, good of heart, to get close to them, etc. And the idea of a virgin not having um, sin maiden. was part of that, a maiden and whatnot. Um, but most of them are either gray or all the way to the you know, the, the dark side, um, or can very easily turn to the dark side. And the unicorns, one of the few that I can think of that, um, are truly always, always good. They never tricked anybody. You can look at a selkie while technically they are good because they didn't harm anybody. They didn't help anybody either. Right. Tricked. A lot of it was tricksters and a lot of it, that old lore came from things that people couldn't understand. Um, but there's research out there. But most of them, I think, fall either to the gray, where they could be good or bad. Can you throw a few solid suggestions of bad? And Aaron, of bad. Yeah, and if you need a moment Ooh. to mull it over, I'll toss it to Aaron. By the way, uh, Mira says European dragons, specifically as well, they were never viewed as good until recently. Now, Tempe, let right. me ask you, are you looking at just European mythology, or do you want to go into Indian and... Chinese and oh, Japanese uh, mythology. Food dogs. Well, hold on. Yeah, I'm Look. trying to stick with like the King Arthur. Okay, European guys. So stay European, away yes. from. There's always hags. Hags are nice. They're basically, right. the old oh, yeah. witches who, you know, they look like the harmless little old lady, but they actually have very developed. Baba Yaga is is a classic example of this. A Russian mythology of a woman who went around in a hut made of bones of her victims. She'd put up a fence of bones, and her hut had chicken legs that would rise up and move across the countryside, gathering young children. Krampus... Interesting. Krampus, um, is, right. ...would work with Sinterklaas. And instead of just children getting coal, the really bad children would be snatched up and tortured and imprisoned by this thing. Um, right. Going back to Greek... Anything anthropomorphized, basically the Minotaur, the Sphinx. Uh, well, the Sphinx is more Egyptian. Um, Egyptian had a lot of uh, that going on oh, too. Oh, fawns and friggin' uh, centaurs, satyrs, uh, nymphs, wood nymphs. I have wood nymphs. Yes, I actually, I actually have some wood nymphs in in this story as well. So, um, but yeah, that that's thank you. That's the, that's kind of what I was looking for. Was just kind of what fell on what end. Because again, I'm kind of. No, uh, you, you you got a lot of uh, neutral. Any of the uh, right. the demigods that friggin' descended from uh, your Greeks because they were still immortal. They were just about, um, right. which is kind of a great thing because it's one of those. They had the blood of the gods and they're running around, and it's kind of one of those the 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 drop of blood. 
and they got power in a very limited way. Right. John, you had you were waving. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, and, and unfortunately, typically, um, beauty tended to put you on your light side of your spectrum. So your unicorns and the selkies and those types of Mermaid. creatures. Mermaids. And then, it, although we knew sirens and stuff could do some pretty bad things. Right. Yeah. Um, and then on the opposite side, you had your goblins and your trolls and your orcs. Those tended to be, you know, the ugly creatures, but unfortunately they were always cast onto the dark side of the thing. Um, so that, that's <coughs> what fits into those things. Gnomes were considered typically in fantasy, probably overall good. And I'm just giving you a broad spectrum, not. But not you know, necessarily I, classically. I, I, if we go historically, gnomes descended well, mythology-wise from brownies and other tricksters that would trap you and use you or, you know, steal your children. Um, and again, if we go... These are the sanitized current things of, of them. Yes, historically, through poems and stuff like that, the they were quite right. wicked. And anything that lived in the water was potentially going to kill a sailor one way or the other. Don't forget right. about the Gorgon and her sister Medusa, who were cursed by the gods with, because of their beauty, to turn men to stone. Right. Um, so this is also depending, if you want to tie it into a previous situation, it then creates this monster down the road who is somebody who did nothing wrong except piss off a god and now they're a monster. And right. considered right. evil just because that curse has changed them in a way that is now harmful to others. Right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, yes, that's that's what I was looking for. That's the kind of things I was trying to, you know, because I'm trying to stick with the classical stuff. I'm trying to, what's the classical good versus the evil type things when I'm laying the characters out. Let me out. also uh, put this out there. I mentioned demons earlier where I can make up all these crazy creations. We do have our classic demons and devils, which might be anthropomorphized, you know, a human body with goat legs and a goat head, or devils that just have small vestigial horns. Um, so there's some more stuff, and that allows you a lot of freedom to do anything you want with that. It also allows you to group because later, once uh, Christianity came around, all fairies were demons. They right. were all right. foreign beings from a different place that came here to torture and terrorize. Right. Uh, you also have the muses and the fates. Right. Uh, which were great, because uh, there's a seven muses, I think, in the three fates. Correct. Uh, and they were neutral, but they did things. There was always so a you string attached. On... There was always a string attached. And they relate back to the hags that I mentioned. So they were essentially hags where, yeah, they'd do things for you and they'd work it out, but there was a string attached. There was something they didn't tell you. There was a price that you'd have to pay. John? No, I, I was just going to ask Teppy, do you, do you consider critters more non humanoids or do you consider them like I'm saying, um, like the fates would just be a, a, a human kind of in that thing. Are you looking for the typical animalistic monsters? Or... I was look okay. So I have my my big bad character. I was looking for like what she would use as you know to to do her bidding wolves. type thing. Wolves, wolves. bats, yeah. rats. Oh, wolves, uh, cat Sith. Right. Cat Sith. Cat Sith. Okay. Is that with a K or a C? No, no as in Cat Sith. Okay. Like, um. So <laughs> there's a good starter, and at this point in time, feel free to contact us when we're not on the show, or we can right. revisit the topic and specifically bring in the creative topic, European mythology creatures. And because right. I'm sure any one of us could talk for a fair amount of time on that. It's uh, okay. I'm going to move us to the second part because Tempe said she kind of has some stuff to work with. Uh, but <laughs> yes, I, I don't you. mind going into the uh, technical hour here because I think the technical hour, I don't know how much we'll have to go on about it. And Aaron just did put a link into 
the uh, chat there about the cat Sith. So okay. you could check that out. He could drop it in Discord also if you're not watching the stream. Okay. Um, but you better have Jabberwocky. Jabberwocky is a Jabberwocky. great thing to research. Um, you might also watch okay. <laughs> Beowulf, Clash of the Titans, um, and look into some of these. These are not necessarily King... They're not Arthurian legends, but they go back right. further. Oh, Hold on a second. Yeah. Let me raise a glass here to Trin. Nine months in a row. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Trin, for that subscription. Good to see you. We're going to move into the technical topic now. Though we can always tangent back to this, Tempe, if you come up with another question. <laughs> okay. All right. You Thank know, you. We're here to help each other as well as viewers, so don't hesitate to be bold and say, stop. I need to know this because I am so going to do that in a few weeks when I start looking into advertising and I am going to totally rail you guys into what I want to know. Use us. We're here for that. Um, don't ever worry about upsetting us with that. You can derail us to help you do what you want to do better. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> Trend's out of here. Bye, Trend. Um, the second hour is going to be price point it's the technical thing we're going to discuss price point of our own books of other people's books and we're going to go all over the place um and if we don't we've done it wrong because that's what we do um i want to do a reintroduction of everybody and i want to give our usual pitch here at this point in time let's go in reverse and let tempe go first with her introduction please I am Tempe Wade. I'm the author of the Timely Revolution book series, uh, which is a historical time travel revolutionary war fantasy adventure. Very good. And Tara? She's got an alarm going off. She has muted herself. Is it very, very loud? Okay. Hey, I'm Tara Fuller. I'm Dreamer in Chief <laughs> at Dream Punk Press. Um, Riley for Real, Gamers, since it's Pride Month. Um, both by great authors available, and I'm gonna run and go figure out what alarm is going Very on because I'm alive. Now, here's what I'm gonna tell you guys about Tara: is she runs Dream Punk Press. If you are an aspiring author who has completed a book, um, including possibly cover and editing, she is one to contact if you want to go underneath a uh, what's the right word, Aaron? Not brand, um, not label. What do we call publishers? Imprint. Imprint, thank you. Um, so make sure you check her out. Aaron has posted the links for you of Jane Punk Press there. Aaron, what about you, sir? Uh, Aaron Kennedy, uh, author of Persona Non Grata, first book in the uh, Ships of Valor series, currently working on uh, the Icarus Black novel. Thank you very much, Tempe. Mm -hmm. sure. um, uh, that's about uh, also a technician at Nick's Heating and Cooling if you, for all your air conditioning needs. Uh, uh, sweating my ass off today after an install. Aaron, let me suggest to you, since you're almost to the 50% point or roundabout with your current book, start looking at covers. Start reaching out to people, getting that started and moving. That way, everything... I already am with Michael Thompson of Michael Thompson Books. There you go. Very good. Um, and don't forget to start searching for an editor if you don't already have one. I know. Uh, already am with Tara. <laughs> Very good. Okay. I wasn't sure if you got in with her because I know there's only so much she can do. So I try I not to overburden her with that. But I'm happy to hear you're working with Tara. Oh, no. I'm, I'm, I'm working on getting her to kick you off. I understand <laughs> that. A lot of people feel that way. <laughs> John. I'm uh, John Millington from Conquest Publishing and Jersey Sparky Comics. You can look at some of the projects we're doing at conquestuniverse.com. I will show you another piece of artwork that is in Tara's Say the Well anthology at Dream. Nice. That is Mr. Brooks. Right there. That's a Say the Well, and I'll try to find that picture. Here's something else I want to ask John. Back to your left. There is a piece of artwork laying just underneath what you just held up. Um, can we see that? By the way, there's another piece of Conquest Universe work. No, not that one. That's, yes. a, that's great, but that's not the one I was talking about. <laughs> that's July <laughs> in 2020. The one directly underneath 
what you just laid down. No, to your other left. A mu- <laughs> Under- he was in the Wizard of Zod one. This? Yes. Yeah, hold that up for ah. me. There we go. I like that because it's a different piece. Say again, John. This is Isabella, Dorothy's granddaughter from the Wizard of Oz. This is our steampunk uh, alternate universe called Zod. Dorothy's grandmother? Like, she is a gilf. Granddaughter. Um, Never mind, I take it back. Um, I cannot find that picture in this book. But anyhow, and I am uh, Travis Sivart. Author of one book I was talking about earlier, which I wasn't sure if this was a good cover. But I realized even in the postage stamp size online, you can see the main object on the cover. So it's not as bad as I was thinking it was. And also the title's being large enough. Um, Aaron, if you just do the exclamation point writer, that'll give my links. And there's Tempe holding up Croker Norge Case Files, one of... Tara's favorite books that she edited because she loves that character interaction. Etheric Elements, my first one, which is a anthology of different stories. It's amazing how many reviews I get going, well, the stories didn't connect. It's an anthology. They don't. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's that. Croker and Orge, on the other hand, yeah. is a short story cycle where all the stories do connect. And all these books have different price points for different reasons. An author can pace, uh, base his or hers or theirs price point on a lot of different things. And let's talk about those different things. I will start out and probably end by saying stop undervaluing your own work. Because I'm stuck in the 90s where $8 is too much to pay for a book. <laughs> but we are not in the 90s and $8 is robbing yourself. So, Tara, can we start with you with some thoughts on this and price points? Um, yes. Before you even ever start thinking about how much you're going to ask people to pay for your book, um, make sure that you know how much it's going to cost for whoever is going to actually produce your book to produce it don't start and when you're you're writing and and you finish your your manuscript before you have it formatted start thinking about a price because there's a lot that goes into what you're going to have to sell it for as a minimum right whether you're doing it in kdp or if you're doing it in ingram if i can interrupt real quick pod one bottom line is your price is not your profit And you need to keep that in mind, this whole conversation. Your price is not your profit. So, Aaron, Tara will pass it to Aaron, but Tara, please finish what you were saying. Apologize for interrupting. So, when um, your, and e-books are slightly different. We're talking a physical book. Um, Finish it. Decide what size you think you want it to be. Format it to that, even if it's just a rough. If I may. When she yep. says size, she means there are different cover sizes you can choose. You can choose the big magazine size. You can choose comic book size. You can't go down to the classic paperback size because that is reserved for established publishers as opposed to self-publishing. So she means physical mm-hmm. length and, and width right. of the cover. So this is a 6 by 9 all right? This is standard... What most, when I was a kid, libraries got this size. Okay. And book clubs. You would get the, the ma- yeah, and mass paperbacks were what you got at the grocery store or at um, a regular bookstore, and that this was supposed to last longer. So this is a six by nine, and then you have a five by eight, and yes, they're 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 two different sizes. Okay. There are other sizes. These are the two physical sizes that DreamPunk Press publishes. This is for our novellas. They're shorter books, okay? So they can handle a, a, a smaller size and be a little bit thicker. Um, so these are novellas, which anything up to 20,000 words or just a little over 20,000 words, we're going to put in a 5 by 8 with a particular price point. This, 
these books right now we are the, the hard copies are six dollars and 99 cents because they're shorter they're a novella but you don't want to publish a novella six by nine because you're not going to get anything on the spine right okay um so a six by nine you look, want something that's a minimum of twenty five thousand words for your middle grade and of course for YA or better you're looking at least you know 50 to 60 or more when you're talking if i could interrupt with a technical point um yes for anybody who's new to writing never ask me how many pages never ask any writer how many pages because pages are all determined by your font size your spacing you know how you break your chapters and all this stuff give a word count this is why you hear us refer to word count instead of pages because I've seen people take a 20,000 word book, double space that thing, put it at 18 font, and then they've got a book this thick when it should be not even room for something on the spine. Right. So you, you, you have an idea of which size you want. In Microsoft Word, figure out you know your, your, um, what font size, what font you're gonna use, because the font you use will make a difference. Um, you can manipulate it even in Microsoft Word down to the size you want. Give yourself 10 pages for your front matter. And we'll give you the number of pages you're going to look at. And then when you go to either KDP or Ingram. Another technical point, if I may interrupt. Front matter, yeah. in that case, this is not only your copyright information and your title page, which you want, you know, a bank, blank page between those, but also your acknowledgments, your dedication, your table of contents. So this is stuff to consider. Go on, Tara. And that's why I said add 10 right. pages to what you get. Um, and that should give you at least a rough word, uh, page count of what you're going to need. And then go into KDP, go into Ingram, go to wherever um, is, is going to be producing the physical book for you. And they have calculators in there. Find it. Put in the number of pages whiter cream guess what makes the difference um put that in and it will come up with a price that it's going to cost them to produce for you not what you're going to sell it for um that gives you your minimum and i know if you're in kdp it will give you the minimum a minimum of what you have to sell it for if, because if i may kdp mm -hmm. for anybody that doesn't know is amazon's okay. publishing it was originally create space and now shove that aside because it doesn't matter they combined it with kdp which stands for kindle direct publishing and they now publish the ebooks as well as the paperbacks i'm just defining things as you go tar just in case somebody mm -hmm. is new to this or picks it up in five years which by the way if you do listen to this five years from now in 2025 not 2020 first of all congratulations for making it second of all shit changed all this information may be outdated, but the basis of knowledge we're handing you is still holds true. Just adjust for change. Go on, Tara. So you will get an estimate in there of what it will cost for them to produce the book. If you're going to sell copies yourself at a con, at book signings, you need to also add in there how much it's going to cost to get to you because you want you want to get covered for that cost. Um, at the same time, if you're if you're using Amazon's production print on demand, um, over and above their cost to produce that copy, they're going to make money. They're you know they're not doing it for free. So these are costs that you have to know is in there. And in the end. If I can you interrupt with the bell here, I just want to say a quick hello to Citric Acid, another streamer. And oh my goodness, Citric, are you a partner now? Did did I know that happened? That is a, a friend of John's who is a streamer out of Texas. So glad to have you swinging by and dropping in. Good to see you. Welcome. And uh, okay, Tara, thank you for being so patient with all my interruptions as I define things and greet people. Carry no. on. Um, also go out and take a look at books in your genre that um, Amazon's a great place to go looking because it tells you in the information how many pages are in that book 
and make sure that you're not pricing too far below that if you or too far above if you are on amazon they do have a tool i think it's just ebook but it might be for both where basically you can go determine my price and it searches its database for similar books on genre on page count word count etc and gives you we think this is a good price and i will guarantee you as a new writer you're going to be like that's too much they have a lot of money in this they paid for that algorithm you might want to take that into consideration tara please go on (laughs) and again thank you um and then um i derailed you i'm sorry there's nothing wrong with charging a little bit less i I had to catch up where my my brain was and pull it back from from jumping ahead there's nothing wrong with charging a little bit less especially if it's your first book um because you don't want to scare folks away and if they're making a decision between two brand new books guess which one they're going to take the one that's 50 cents less okay you're still probably going to make I mean, think about it. I mean, that's how I do it. If I go in here and I'm like, I'm just looking for a book to read and I haven't got a recommendation and I'm just going in and I find two books that I'm interested in and I can only buy one, uh, I'm going to buy the one that's 50 cents less. I want to pass this to Aaron in just a moment here because he's got a lot of, he, he is constantly beating the drum of mm-hmm. it's a business, it's a product. And then Tempe, John, we definitely want your input on this. Yeah. After this, once we get through the technicals. I swear I'm almost done. <laughs> no, you're okay. We'll let you finish then and that, if you're almost done. Um, but we want to yeah. talk about why you guys choose your price points. John, you have a very different perspective on things because you have an industry you must follow or you're broken. Tara, finish your thought. I'm going to make one or two comments and pass it to Aaron. Um, and... So for DreamPunk Press, we've gone through that several times. And what we have is a de- we, we've kind of determined, um, depending on the size of the book and the number of pages, we've come up with a standardized um, price for, for the different word counts and the different pages um, so that um, we're consistent with our products. So, and then what I was trying to get with that is if you are, for your first book, doing it a little bit less, but you might want to bump it up for your next ones. All right. Um, simply because then you're, you know, once you're on the second and the third, if people like your first one, why not make that extra 50 cents? Very good. Uh, first of all, let me say about Dream Punk Press. As I mentioned when Tara stepped away for a moment, Dream Punk Press is a growing imprint who is still looking for new authors, Tara? Oh, always. Very good. So if you guys are publishing your first book or your 50th book, please take her into consideration. Take a look at what she has to offer. It is much more of a uh, publishing group than a publishing company. And we're not going to explain that right now. If you've been around, you may know what that means. If you don't, Tara will explain it when you reach out to her if you do so. Um, Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to say is, What Tara mentioned about pricing, there is more than one point of view on that. Um, Something we talk about here a lot is you have to be your own biggest fan of your books. And that confidence of pricing it equivalent to everybody else's, sometimes... Now, this is, if you're like, I'm going to put my book at $0.99 for the ebook instead of $3.99 or $4.99, what Amazon recommends, you are hurting yourself at that point. There's a psychology in human beings that Aaron may or may not touch on here about something being cheaper in price is of less value, even though your work is not of less value. So 50 cents is one thing, $3 less, you may be hurting yourself with that and keep that in mind. Um, Yes, we're all nervous. Yes, we're all worried, whether it's our first book or 50th. But don't screw yourself because we're human and have confidence issues. Aaron. You got some... Oh, hold on. Tara, were you done? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry. For the moment, until everybody else goes through. And then <laughs> Look, I'm I've turned all ahead. Canadian. I, I'm, I'm apologizing <laughs> after everything I say to you. <laughs> um, Aaron. <laughs> all right. Uh, I want to lead in with uh, the comment you made. Your price is not your profit. Okay? Uh, the big thing here is your profit is your payroll. We are a business. Um, as a writer... You've got to recoup your time to pay yourself. And what does that all incorporate, Aaron? Oh, uh, your computer, your internet, your research, 
uh, your trips to the library, which includes your gas. Um, Travis, I believe you live out in the middle of bumfuck Egypt. Yeah. Um, um, the new booster to, uh, to stream all of this. Uh, your trips out to talk to John um, and things like that. Tempe, you're currently doing research on monsters and things like that. So you may pick up a monster manual, which is 50 friggin' dollars. Um, and worth getting, but if you can, find it on eBay and get the <laughs> older ones, not the yes. newer ones. The newer oh. ones have a lot of uh, new content that's been reimagined. So we could talk about that another time. But, you can pick yep. up for free at Jersey's Garden Comics. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Go talk to John. Aaron, yeah, so, there, there, what about editing and cover are... prices, Aaron? No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Covers. Uh, I had spoken to uh, Michael Thompson and Michael Thompson's books. Uh, a, the cost of a good cover um, is easily $1,000. Uh, I need to touch base with uh, Tara. Uh, if I may, to the cost of... I'm oh, going to interrupt ahead. you just like I did her. Guys, you can go out and get a $25 cover. You can go to Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R dot com, and get somebody to throw a cover together for less than it costs to eat out. Oh, yeah. But Absolutely. You, you can. get what you pay for let me stress that once again you get what you pay for and paying for a 25 dollar oh. <laughs> cover gets you a cover but it's never gonna be a great cover something else i'll tell you if you have an artist doing work for you they're your employee don't hesitate within your contract and whatever they allow revisions changing it so it makes it right also don't hesitate to change artists look at perfor uh, portfolios look at past work make sure their work is what you want and get somebody's opinion because of your own because yours is not always the public's uh, that said i am a tradesman okay i'm a journeyman electrician i am a journeyman freaking hvac guy i make a lot of money fixing other people's work tara do you make a lot of money fixing other people's work? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you giggling? <laughs> Travis, did Tara make a lot of money off you fixing other people's work? <laughs> Tara has made way less than she ever should have on everything she's should. done for me. Um, she is an incredible editor. I adore working with her. My only complaint about her is criticize me more, please, so I can improve yes. my product. And I apologize if I've mispronounced your name. I'm from Texas. I fuck people's names up Tara, all, all the time. Tara. Mira mm -hmm. needs your information on how to get a hold of you. She is looking through your website and not finding a place to contact you. Okay. Dreampunkpress at gmail.com. Very Ta easy. And Tara, go double check. Make and sure it that's on your... should be on there, and I'll double check that the website has it. Yeah. So. Then we'll waggle a figure, Mira. She's a regular here. We can harass her a little bit. <laughs> Aaron, okay. go on. Uh, but that said... Um, Tempe, would you mind holding up my book real quick? Uh, yeah, hang on. Thank you, Tempe. <laughs> and then just flip it over to the back side. I believe I've got the cover price of mine set at $15, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, uh, oh good Lord. <laughs> I don't have my glasses on. Can you see yep. it? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, but, yes, mine was done through KDP, I believe, or Ingram Spark. It was done through one of the two. Um, but uh, it was set. I did a lot of research at the time. Um, and then on uh, on Amazon, friggin' the ebook copy is set at three ninety nine. The reason it's set at three ninety nine is so that I friggin' I bottomed it out so that I make the maximum of thirty percent. I think it is thirty or seventy percent. Uh, because if you set it lower than that, you get ten percent. Mm -hmm. um, I get seventy cents a copy on it. If I uh, Aaron, your the, price is not on here. <laughs> which, There's no price on your. Let program. me recommend never put your price on your book anymore that's an antiquated concept book prices change constantly as the economy changes um huh. yeah. so don't put it on there and also uh, we're often talking about kdp and amazon as tara has pointed out there are other places smashwords ingram and many many other places where you can do this one big thing about price point are you going on a print on demand where you don't have to store books, they go to a website, order it, that website prints it, ships it, done. The older way of doing it, which you still can do, is go through somebody else, pay literally seven to $12,000, if not more at this point in time, get a thousand copies in your house and have to store them, ship them, lug them, etc. So 
Predominantly here, we're going to be discussing things such as Amazon, which is our baseline, and branching out to these other people that do mostly print on demand. Make sense, Aaron? Yeah. No, okay. no. Uh, apparently, I did not put my uh, thing on there because we probably had this conversation and I updated it. Could be. Could be. It's Yeah, yeah. it's uh, at one point in time I considered doing it also, but that price... If three years from now you don't change your cover and somebody orders it for twenty dollars instead of fifteen and gets it at their house and sees that price on the back, they're going to be like, "Uh, the hell, Tara." Uh, just, I don't think they will put it on your cover anymore. I okay. don't believe your price is part of the barcode information anymore. Mine uh, is. Yeah, the last one I did. It, it is. is on okay. Yeah, I went through Boker, and they put, actually. You know what? You're right, because I just looked at the new one. I was looking at the first one, mm -hmm. but the uh, the second one does the new one does not have it on there. John, interesting. Because I thought it was John. on there. It, it it does depend on the industry. So role playing games are books, but they have they're they're barcoded or they're priced. But they are working at a level that we are not currently on. Hopefully, one day every single one of us and a lot of you guys will be on that level. We are not there at this point. Uh, Aaron, you had more to go into. I oh, love yeah. when you point out, don't forget, you have paid this much for a cover, this much for an editor, and that's where you were when we, like, interrupted you with 50 things. Yep. Um, so, freaking you, you've got costs um, that you've got to recoup. Um, I'll point out, I haven't recouped those costs yet. Friggin, I, I just haven't done it, especially the time. Um, I've probably recouped my cover costs. I've recouped my edit editor costs. If I may... Friggin but, oh yeah, absolutely. This book right here, children's book, adorable, awesome, incredible artist. Over three years since I published it, I have only recently passed a hundred dollars profit. Okay, so this is something to keep in mind. Now maybe you'll be like Ready Player One and get into this deal where you are just in demand and oh my God, good for you. But in the world most of us live in, that's not the case. But, um, but uh, all of us got hourly rates. Tara's got an hourly rate. John's got an hourly rate. I've got an hourly rate. Uh, my default hourly rate is a little over $100 an hour. You call me up, and that's my default. Okay, he's not a I gigolo, mean, guys. Through. What do you do that you have a $100 rate? You want to clarify real quick? <laughs> uh, gigolo, sir. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. I always just got it for free. I don't know what he does. <laughs> no, no. Uh, <laughs> as a tradesman, my default hourly rate is about $100 an hour. As a technical writer, my default hourly rate is about $100 an hour. Uh, that's how much I deem my time worth. You know, I was joking um, about sleeping with you, but maybe I should at that rate. <laughs> uh, I am that good. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you know what? For you, I'll discount it down to seventy-five. <laughs> a bargain at twice the price. Go on with way. <laughs> okay, but um, store. to write a book like that, it took about a year's time. So that's two thousand hours. So work out the math. Uh, so you got to figure out a two hundred thousand hour, two hundred thousand dollars get the get the money back. Um, may I uh, suggest? Don't look at that that way. Look at it the way a mechanic oh, no. does. Anytime a mechanic does work, they have a book going, this is the average how long it takes to do that job on your car. So I'm charging oh, this much. Because it might take you a year or much longer to write a whole book of, let's use 50,000 words as a bare bones example. I wrote oh. a 60,000 word book in 12 days. And it's in Tara's hands now. So... Oh, no. You have to look at what is the industry standard, how long does this take? Because if I charge by the hour for a 12-day book that has as many or more or less words in Aaron's book where he's doing 2,000, but again, your time is money. And even if you look at minimum wage, and even if you write 1,000 words per hour, which is a fair amount, um, you have to look at a 50,000-word book taking... 50 hours and you know what I'm doing easy math here $10 an hour instead of minimum wage um, that's still $500 worth of time mm -hmm. okay go on here 
Well, you got to, but it's time you got to recoup. Is it my, is my underlying it is. point. Yes. So. Yeah, just don't forget that you put time into right. it, and that is worth something. Absolutely, right. and it's very it easy. It's the one thing you can't get back. It Correct. Is. And it's very easy at the end of the process when you're just super excited about publishing this book to put it up for 99 cents of the ebook and Amazon KDP is telling you, oh, the minimum price is $11.48. So you're like, I'm going to make a couple bucks profit and put it at 15 or 14.99 because of the psychology of buying. You drop it that one penny, so those people, you know. But you have to keep in mind, you have just spent how many hours writing it? Plus uh, 200 to $2,000 for editing. And don't be surprised if you hit an editor that says $2,000 for your 50,000 word book, let alone if you have more. Um, yeah, you might be able to get it less. Great. But you might not. It all depends where you look. And by the way, for an editor, absolutely review their work. Go read the books they edited. I have made this mistake, and I have paid for it. Matter of fact, first time I went to Tarts because she grabbed one of my books and went, do you mind if I... Uh, and I went, oh, yeah, great. And it was like a 10th grade essay, fucking red lines everywhere. And I went, oh, well, I want you to re-edit it. And she went, well, I won't charge you. And I thought Tara was a moron. Um, I went, no, I absolutely, I will pay you again for this book because it's unfair for my lack of research to not pay you. Um, a good editor is invaluable. They are almost a writing partner, just like if you reach out to an agent. That agent is almost like a, it, definitely a business partner, at minimum. They're going to do everything they can to improve your product because that's their work now, too. So keep that in mind. So cover, which, as Aaron pointed out, look at $1,000. Ballpark. Now, you can pay six grand for that cover. And you can pay 25 bucks. Keep in mind that fluctuates drastically depending what you want. But something, and I know I'm dominating right now. I will. I swear I'll pass this on You're in a fine. moment, guys. That cover, okay, the spine, the title makes them pick it up and look at the cover. That cover makes them open that book. If you have a blurb in the front or a blurb on the back, that might make them open the book after looking at the cover. That first paragraph makes them read on. If they get past three chapters, you have a reader. So I once heard one writer say, oh, I've got ten books, which was very impressive to me at the time with only two or three. And here's the deal. I recommend you always pay for a good cover over a good editor. And I, I, like my mentally, I didn't open my mouth, thankfully, but mentally my brakes went on. I went, how about you work an extra month in your day job and pay for a good editor and a good cover? Because that cover will sell that book, but a good editor sells your next book. And if you screw yourself on editing, you screw yourself for every purchase from that reader from there on. Okay, I'm done. Okay. Um... <laughs> uh, quick note on that though friggin the, the first book friggin uh, and Travis made this mistake too you want to have series as well because friggin um, and I, I've done the same thing uh, I wrote the first one uh, I left it on a good solid note though um, to where I could write stuff within the same series um, and the Icarus Black one I set up to be a series it's in the same universe uh, which makes it nice um, but this one's going to be, I've mapped it out. I, Before I wrote three words in the first book, um, I wrote out a plan. I had, okay, this is what this book's going to be. This one's the second book. This one's the third book. This is the series arc. This is going to be the second series arc. This is the third one. This is how everything links together. Um, and here's how they're going to financially link together. Um because, oh, can I give this, once this one's written, can I give this one away as a loss leader? Um, would you like fries with that? Um, <laughs> I, I was busy it. banning somebody, so I didn't actually pay attention to the first thing you said. But here's what I'll tell you. What Aaron is talking about is there is a point in time 
where it's worth handing something out for free just to get somebody to pick up your other stuff. It can be the first book, which is, Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, that's what you were talking about, yeah? Yes. Once you're established and have a second or third book, especially a third book, consider writing a short story of 3,000 to 25,000 words that ties in. Maybe it's that epilogue about the, or I'm sorry, the prologue about that character that just you didn't put it in the book because it wasn't necessary. But it's still interesting, and that might be a great freebie to hand somebody from your website. Ah, uh, Scribbler, it's not you. It's somebody who basically came in and was being a moron, so we moved on. Um, uh, Jim, uh, Jim Butcher does a great job th with this because he's got a couple little uh, short stories, like his side jobs and stuff like that. He's got all the Dresden novels, and then he's got a bunch of short stories that are published um, ad hoc uh, along the way. He's, I think he's got three or four books that are just 3,000, 4,000 words here. They're just chapters, uh, but they got the side characters that are going along the way, and they add fluff. Wrap up your thoughts. I mean, complete them. Oh. But we are 15 minutes out. I definitely want to give John and Tempe a chance to talk oh, a little absolutely. bit because we have so... Uh, <laughs> the, the big thing is, this is a business. We are here to make money. Uh, your price point is designed to get money in your pocket. I realize we're doing this for the love of the thing, but... Uh, if you're going to publish, is, make the money. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you're not going to publish, yes. write for passion. Yep. Uh, is it needed? Are you passionate about it? Uh do you like do uh are you good at it and do you have the background to do it those four things Aaron, i'm going to interrupt meet. you again you don't have to be good Done. at it look at twilight look at 50 shades of gray the bottom line is does it appeal to somebody give um, it to the internet archive what's that john <laughs> if it's a passion give it to the internet archive there you go <laughs> steal it anyway <laughs> So, I'm sorry, Aaron, go on. Done. Okay. John Tempe, would either of you like to actually get a fucking word in edgewise? <laughs> go ahead, Tempe. Would no, you like I... Travis to interrupt you? Because <laughs> I'm going um, to. <laughs> when you're doing your price point, take into account that you have to market the stuff as well. I mean, you okay. have to go to conventions, you have to buy tables, you have to buy ads, you've got to sell it somehow. Well, you don't um, have and... to, but if you want to make money, probably a smart thing to look at yeah and going back to what aaron said about the series stuff um that's what i did with the timely series and every now and then i'll write a short story and i'll drop it i dropped one in the anthology book from mars con that came out about the same time as it was relevant in the book series i also for book eight book seven <laughs> in the series jumping ahead i i wrote a short story and I didn't know where I was going to use it. And I ended up using it in the beginning of one of the other books that's, like, way ahead. Um, but, you know, I dropped it in a blog. And people read it, and they're like, oh, I can't wait. And I'm like, well, you got to wait a few books because it's going in, like, book seven or eight. It's down the road. But, you know, keep that interest going. See, Tempe, um, that's a great thing to put up for free to sign up for a newsletter, which will be a whole different show. <laughs> Newsletters. Right. And, and as far as price points, um, Keep in mind too when you're pricing your paperback and your ebook, um, don't put your paperback at twenty five dollars and then put your ebook at twenty five dollars. Because, <laughs> by the way, nobody's gonna buy your ebook at twenty five dollars. Just saying. <laughs> don't. Penguin does. <laughs> no, actually. Yeah, I, I would never. Go ahead. Real quick, um, some of your big authors do sell a twenty dollar ebook. And mm -hmm. because they're big, they can. Yeah. Um, I would never pay. It. Personally, I would never pay it for an ebook. I'm so. with you on that, Tempe. I'm absolutely with you. I'm like, I don't have a book in my hand. Why did you just charge me as much as the printing costs, et cetera, et cetera? I feel that you're a con artist at this point. That's me. Now, maybe one of somebody else out there has a different point of view, a different opinion, a different experience. And it's valid. But for me, I don't feel an electronic, just like when they try to, try to charge me $20 for a digital movie. 
I don't have a manufactured item in my hand. This is not as much of a value as a physical book. Especially exactly. when technically it's only a lease. Yeah, yes, pretty much. Exactly. Exactly. You do not own it. Yeah. Yeah, and you can't hand it to somebody to read and lend out, and you can't put it on a shelf to display it, and you can't bring it somewhere and get it signed, and you can't draw pictures on it of penises and mustaches. I'm not speaking from experience. John, do you have some thoughts? Well, Tara, what, what did a book look like when you were growing up? Can you show us that again? What size were they? I don't know. The, the, uh, Mel Brooks was holding them like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's what ours look like. That's when. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, mine looked like this still. I was a librarian in high school. That's where I spent my volunteer time. You know doing. what? Stop trying to turn me on talking that way. <laughs> um, a key thing that I kind of gathered from a little bit of this is don't set precedences that. You don't want to have uh, follow you in the future. If you get labeled as a cheap ass author, you're gonna be one for the rest of. That's forever. a fair point. If you guys set your ebooks at ninety nine cents and suddenly you're successful, and you're charging four ninety nine for your ebooks, not twenty dollars, four ninety nine for your ebooks, eight ninety nine if you're Stephen King or Koontz or whatever. Suddenly, the the basis you built your career on is looking at this going, wait, what? Why is it suddenly mm -hmm. worth six to ten times more than what I was paying before? Um, and also, don't undervalue your own time, effort, and energy. Recouping your work, your time, your effort at different price points makes a big difference. And it, when we're charging less for a book, especially Tara held one up at five ninety nine for a paperback book, that's less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks, guys. Okay? And any time you hesitate to put a reasonable price, whether that's $0.99 cents for an e-book or three ninety nine or $20 for a paperback, remember that. You pay $20 for a movie on DVD, and that's a cheap price nowadays. That is an hour and a half to two and a half hours of entertainment. A book, substantially more. And keep in mind how many hours even an avid reader that just devour books are getting four to twelve hours out of that one book. And, and if you look at that hourly rate of entertainment, you have value. Now, in our particular industry, as uh, Travis had said, we have industry standards that um, are somewhat template us into prices. Now, that's not always a bad thing because you're expected to get $2.99, $3.99, $4.99 um, for your books. Nobody's going to question that you're getting that because that's what they sell. Uh, you don't have to you know, go back in. Where, but our cost structure is it's pretty similar to what everybody here talked about um, other than uh, we have just more people that are involved uh, we pay royalties or you get a percentage Any commodities uh, now following you. if I may sorry. John sorry to interrupt real quick shout out there to Erica monkey who just threw a follow-up here thank you very much I think Ooh. I've seen you on twitch sings is it where have I seen you Erica but good to have you pardon us while we actually close up our topic okay carry on John um, so we set up a royalty structure. So if your book were to ever be reprinted, like for Marvel or DC, um, into a graphic novel or other things, then you, you get royalties based off of your original works and stuff. Um, we tend to pay, uh, structured based on who did what in the book. So with like Mercedes Lackey writing one of our titles, she's going to get paid more because She's a celebrity compared to other people in the book. So you have to kind of tier who gets what in our industry. Now, for our particular company, uh, we have people that are doing their, the whole project themselves, per se, minus the editing and some of the setups and stuff. 
but our price points, uh, the printing and all that type of stuff, when it comes to orders, uh, we submit to uh, Diamond Comics and we're probably, the industry's changing pretty drastically right now. Yeah. We're hoping that Diamond actually picks up like Amazon and offers independent publishers the ability to print. Hmm. Uh, save us some money, specifically in drop shipping is, is a nightmare. Um, you know, close to the warehouse, do the printing there, save some money in, in that aspect. We'll see where the industry goes. Um, but when we get orders in, if we print more books, you know, let's say that uh, we get, I, I know that we already have 5,000 uh, people that said that they would get our first book. Well, and if we go to Diamond and they say, well, we're going to order 5,000 also, so we know we're at 10,000, let's say it's going to cost us five grand to print. For another $500, we might get 20,000 copies. So we have to determine, is it worth it to front load this? Because comic books are collectible, so you want first prints, and you want to take inventory with you at that time. Unlike other industries if i wait and then reprint it i have to put second printing third printings it devalues the the property right. first um so those are, are things that you have to take into account now we're fortunate that on our board we have a lawyer so he sets up all the contracts creators maintain all the rights to their books if they take it somewhere else straight um, I mean, that's what we really want to happen anyway. We're a mentor program. So, go ahead, Travis. Guys, we're three minutes out from ending the show for the night. We have just crammed a hell of a lot of information right into this right here. And Tempe hasn't even spoken at length. She spoke a little bit. But here's what I want to do. I want to get some final thoughts, information, whether it's a reiteration or something new. I'm just going to go around my screen here as opposed to the Twitch screen. Tempe, do you have any closing thoughts on this? Um, like you said, just don't undervalue yourself, but don't overvalue yourself on like your e-bike prices too, because you're you're surely gonna shoot yourself in the foot if you've got twenty dollars on your paperback and twenty dollars on your ebook. You've got to remember too that most people buying books buy three or four at a time, and you know if, if they're two ninety nine, three ninety nine, they're more willing to pay that rather than twenty dollars for one. Right. So that's just kind of something you have to keep in mind. You have to kind of keep with the industry standards a little bit as well. Tara? Um, yeah, just kind of what John brought up. Um, when you look at self-publishing or independent publishing, you're probably looking at print-on-demand. Costs for that up front are higher than if you're doing 10,000 copies. Correct. And so be be aware of that when you're looking at pricing books. If you're looking at and you're looking for comparison books, try to find other POD or MOD, which is print on demand, manufacture on demand titles, um, because it's kind of unfair to yourself as brand new getting into this. If you're looking at the cost of mass produced, as in you know large runs. Where they're printing them for a dollar fifty each, when your base POD price is darn near near six dollars. So make sure when you're looking at it that you're you're doing that. Now with that, if you're on that other side and, and you can afford to do ten thousand copies and it's cheap, they have to be stored. You're not, they're not going to work in your garage because your garage is damp. So you're going to house them somewhere. There's a cost. So just kind of make sure you, you do some research, talk to people, and don't be afraid to ask questions because most self-publishers are very willing to talk to you because they've been there. Right. Aaron? Um, it's a business. Run it like a business. Take business classes, even the online ones like Coursera. Uh, Harvard's, got, Harvard's got some free classes online. Uh, spend the 15 20 minutes uh once a week to do the stuff um there's all kinds of stuff sit here for right night and watch us we'll go over the stuff once a week saturdays at eight that's right john the industry is changing drastically form alliances 
ask people questions. Yes, you're a business, but you also need to learn. I mean, we start out with budgets and stuff like that. I mean, those are also, as Aaron pointed out, I mean, we've spent probably $40,000 in infrastructure for upcoming websites, digital assets, photography stuff. It's just, but form alliances, find out what other people are doing and ask questions. Very good. Or you're going to get bit in the ass sometime. Yeah. Again, the two pieces of advice I'll give is, uh, you know what, I'm going to up it to three. First of all, research, research, research. Um, compare yours to others. Don't undervalue your own work just because you're new. But use the tools available to check on that. And also, as I said in the beginning of the show, I'll reiterate, your profit is not your price point. Um, I'll tell you this. Most of my books, if I go and buy 10 copies or 100 copies and have Amazon ship them to me, cost about $5, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, depending on the page count in that case. Um, Amazon dictates for that book, whether it's this book, this book, or this book, generally 9 to $13 is what Amazon is taking off the top. Now, that includes your royalties. Anything beyond that, and that's minimal royalties. Anything beyond that is profit. And you can up your price on Amazon to what you want it to be. So just, that's all part of the research. Don't undervalue your own work. And your price point is not your profit. I want to thank each of the writers here that came in and hung out with us tonight. I want to thank all the viewers that... uh by the way, uh, Witch Doctor says, I was told that often your fellow writers are your best resources. Absolutely, Witch. They are a great resource. They are not the only resource. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Do not believe me, John, Aaron, Tempe, or Tara without doing research about industry standards. I'm sorry. Doctor? Oh, anyhow. Um, yeah, which is Doctor. I'm sorry. Uh, anyhow, you guys have a great night. We are here every Saturday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Barring life circumstances, join us live on Twitch or catch us afterwards on one of the many places we have podcasts. We're going to do our closing music and dance a little bit. Everybody hang out afterwards, and we will do the raid on Twitch. But I want to end the show here for the other folk. Here's our closing music. Thank you, everybody. Where the hell is it? There it is. Thank you for joining author Travis I. Sivar and the other writers, content creators, and all around amazing people for our discussion here on Right Night. Join us again soon, and until you do, make sure you create with passion, enjoy the journey, and remember, every night can be right.